Hello, beautiful beings. Do you like that name? Just came to me. Although you are all king and queens, mainly queens, listening, watching, the words beautiful beings just came to me. Welcome to another episode with me, Victoria. Today's episode was inspired by my dog walk this morning with my super cute and fluffy Malamute called Hero. And the title of this episode, I'm sure you know, is called Why Am I Still Binging When I Am Not Physically or Mentally Restricting? Great question, don't you think? If you're further along in this work, you will know the different concepts concepts that between physical restriction and mental restriction. Those of you that don't know, it's okay. I'll just recap really quickly. Physical restriction is kind of what it says on the tin. Wanting to eat something, let's say a piece of cake, but not allowing yourself to physically eat it. Mental restriction is very sneaky. And this leads me on to my continuation of what I want to talk about. And even though the title is when I'm not mentally and physically restricting, I just want to double take with you on mental restriction because mental restriction is any kind of restriction mentally. And I'm going to give you a list of examples because it's important to just make sure and to double down on the fact that you are not still indeed mentally restriction because Mental restriction can be extremely sneaky. So I would like you to get extra curious and start to notice where you might still perhaps be restricting. And mental restriction is any behavior that is driven by the goal or the hope of weight loss that's restriction. And therefore, it will create an equal and opposite reaction. So mental, sneaky mental restriction can look like, but not limiting to, not limited to one of these things, or all of these things, or some of these things. Overachieving at recovery, this is what I used to do, overachieving at recovery and challenging yourself to eat the thing for me, it used to be jars of Nutella with the hope that if you eat enough of it, you won't want to eat as much in the future, whether that's for health related reasons or or weight related reasons. So I used to at the beginning of my recovery challenge myself to eat the jar of Nutella, because then if I thought if I kind of, quote, got it out my system and almost not really force fed myself because that was in the energy that I used to have behind binges towards the end of my binge when I really did not want to eat any more food, but I literally force fed myself for two reasons. One, so it wasn't in the house, so I could start dieting the next day. And two, it was almost kind of like a, a punishment or some kind of like, I've just got to eat it because otherwise I'm not going to get to eat it again because I'm cutting sugar out for the rest of my life. Lol. Next joke. How long did you, how many times have you told that to yourself? Anyway, so in terms of like me with the Nutella, I was also eating it, hoping that I wouldn't continue wanting to eat jars of Nutella, which kind of seems obvious. And you'll be pleased to know I don't want to. And so therefore I don't sit and eat jars of Nutella anymore. But the hope that I had that I wouldn't was still a form of mental restriction. I told you it could be sneaky. Another form of sneaky mental restriction could be eating the thing, but simply wishing you didn't want to eat the thing. So perhaps you're eating crisps because Victoria says allow everything. So allowing your trigger food or past trigger food, which was crisps, and eating them and allowing them but kind of wishing you didn't want to eat them because of some judgment around it. Um, a, ment- a sneaky mental restriction can be any form of rule around food at all. So this can look like saying to yourself, I can eat as much chocolate as I want, as long as I only eat it in the weekends or on the evenings, every evening, for example. That's still restriction. You could say to yourself, I cannot buy X yz food and keep it in the house because otherwise i'll eat it all 
that kind of seems obvious but even if you notice you're shopping and you perhaps would like something in the house but you're scared that you'll eat it well that's the point in buying it you're going to eat it when you want it right so if you have you don't have to buy everything in the house all the time but if you're not buying it because you're scared of the fact you'll eat it that's the whole point right so just challenge that fear mental restriction can look like justifying what you're eating in any way for example it's my birthday today so I'm allowed to eat whatever or I've been to the gym so it's okay that I eat this that is still some kind of restriction and another example could be having any kind of judgment at all towards your food choices even a positive judgment right so hear me out on this if for example you've said no to dessert one time and you feel good and kind of like oh like look at me I I didn't have dessert and you make it into like a bit of a celebration which I understand why a previous binge eater would do that what you're doing there because we live in a dualistic world because you're feeling good about not having dessert you're automatically creating the opposite of that which is feeling bad or partially feeling bad at least unconsciously when you do want the dessert in the future so there are just a few examples those are just a few examples of sneaky restriction so before we go into like the context of the body of what I want to talk about today I really do want you to like have a double double take and really get nitty-gritty with yourself and ask yourself am I still mentally restricting and if so what does that look like in my life and what I'm telling myself and then we can take a look at that right the next thing I want to share with you is a quote that I've said many times before but it's such an important one so I'm going to share it with you today and that is allowance creates space for choice I don't care what you eat or what you don't eat I care about how you feel about what you eat or what you don't eat It's your relationship to your food choices that actually matter the most. And the best way to create this is through neutrality and listening to your body. From a place of allowance and neutrality, you can make a relaxed choice by choosing whatever feels best for you in the moment. And I want to emphasize here that every single moment is going to be different. For example, one day you might choose to have a slice of cake when you meet your friend for a coffee date. And another day you might choose to have a panini and a side salad instead of the cake because that day you might not have eaten anything yet and you want to make sure you're getting enough nourishment and perhaps you have a meeting in the afternoon. So you want to feel energized and not on a sugar high, right? One evening, you might choose to eat a tub of Ben and Jerry's ice cream or I don't know why I have to say Ben and Jerry's. I'm not a Ben and Jerry's sponsor. I always seem to talk about Ben and Jerry's ice cream in general or a tub of something. You might want to say and eat a tub of ice cream in front of the TV simply because it feels good. Another night, you might choose not to eat a tub of ice cream simply because you don't want to go to bed feeling really full. You want to get a good night's sleep because you have a really busy day the next day. So those are just a few examples of like how each moment can be different in terms of your choices from the foundation of allowance and neutrality. So I just want you to double check that mental restriction isn't creeping in to you, for you, around your thoughts and around your food choices. And if they are, if you're, if you've listened to this bit so far and you're like, okay, shit, I didn't think I was restricting, but I definitely am restricting. I'm judging myself all the time. Or you might only be judging yourself when you're eating certain amounts or types of foods. And you might be thinking, well, how the fuck can I stop doing that? How can I stop mentally restricting? Great question. It's a process over time. And what else I'm going to share with you in this episode will absolutely help you as well. Like come to this place of like non-judgment at all. But it's a process over time. Just having a few mantras, a few things that you say to yourself that bring relaxation, that bring comfort to yourself. Like when you're noticing the judgment around food, for example, a few of mine used to be, I trust my body to guide me what to eat. And when I used to be scared to eat something that used to be a big trigger food of mine, it would just be something as simple as 
it's safe to enjoy this food. So little things that resonate with you, like said to yourself over time, alongside doing all the other work I teach, like the body image work, the self-love work, the rewiring your mind, the different ways of looking at food, all of that, like over time, the judgment disappears. It's a natural part of this process. So the next thing I wanted to go into was the word binge. I will continue using the word binge or binging in this episode because it makes sense to the context of what I want to talk about. However, let's play with the assumption that you're not mentally restricting, yet you're still, in quotes, binging. If you think about it, the word binge in and of itself is a judgment, So I recommend that you remove the word binge from your vocabulary and whilst you're at it, remove the word should as well, because whenever we say I should do this or I shouldn't do that, you're actually giving your power away. You're thinking that you should be doing something differently to what you're doing. It takes away the power of choice. You can actually switch the word should to I could or I get to because then you remind yourself that you have a choice and you're not being in like victim state, like, yeah, well, I should do this, but I'm not, and therefore I'm not good enough. And it kind of has like a victim-y, state feeling to it, which is okay, but just a tip, if you want to feel more empowered, remove the word should, remove the word binge from your vocabulary. And talking of the word binge again, it naturally has a feeling of like wrongness to it. And it's like a heavy feeling of like you're doing something wrong or you're doing something naughty or it's just not a great word to use so associating the word binge in recovery makes no sense to use that so I have an invitation for you to swap the word binge to something like eaten past fullness or ate a lot of food or even I continued eating when I really didn't want to. You can use those types of wording instead of the word binge because words are very powerful. And those types of wording like I've eaten past fullness has no morality around it. It's just a simple statement like I've eaten past fullness other than I've binged. It feels like really heavy and emotionally uncomfortable. And also take a look if you're if you're hearing the words eaten past fullness, eating when I didn't really want it, ate a lot of food, and you think that it's not okay to do those things, then you're definitely experiencing some sneaky mental restriction because there's nothing bad or wrong about eating past fullness, for example. So just another way of checking your mental restriction. And so let's now, let's really, really, really assume that you really have stopped restricting mentally and physically, and you don't see that eating a lot of food or eating past fullness is bad in any way. It's just neutral to you, yet you're curious as to why you seem to be eating 300 grams of chocolate every night. And the reason I've used that precise example is because this is exactly what I experienced myself. So I'm going to use chocolate. And I actually had one of my group coaching ladies say to me a couple of months ago, Victoria, what the hell is it with you and chocolate? Like every time I listen to your modules and your content, you use chocolate as an example. And she's not a chocolate kind of gal, right? For her, it was fruit, ironically, because she'd followed like diets that said fruit was the devil because it contained sugar and all of that. So it just makes me smile every time I use chocolate as an example. I'm still never going to stop using that as an example because it was my reality and chocolate was like my kryptonite. So I thought, so I digress with in terms of this example of eating 300 grams of chocolate every night and I said the amount because not that we need to compare but I the reason I said the amount is that from my experience so many people that I speak to have so much shame around eating a family-sized bar of chocolate which is like what 150 grams and I'm sat there quite happily in recovery eating 300 grams of chocolate every single night and not really caring about it it just helps them to feel like more normal right whatever normal is so going back to the story I experienced that myself I wasn't restricting mentally or physically I'd done a shit ton of work around that notice where the little sneaky mental restriction was trying to sneak in and catching it with love and then letting it go and reframing it and reassuring myself and continuing on the path that I've been on for five plus years as I as I record this um 
I had a question asked by me by one of my previous incredible coaches, Dr. Gillian Murphy, that really got me thinking. And she asked me, what evidence do you have that eating that amount of chocolate isn't okay for you? And I was like, that is a really good question. Let me think about it. So I thought about it for a moment. And then I was like, what evidence did I have that it wasn't okay for my body to eat that much chocolate? I slept well after eating it. I felt good whilst eating it. My digestion was fine. I had absolutely zero evidence that eating that much chocolate every night was not serving me. Only the fear I had for my future health or potential weight gain because of everything that I'd read about sugar. And so in fact, when I didn't eat chocolate in the evening, I didn't sleep as well, ironically. I had a slightly uneasy feeling, which was probably and most likely due to the past previous trauma from all the times I've not allowed myself chocolate. And I was just hungrier the next day. Like I was hungrier the second I woke up, which is annoying for me because I don't like to eat the second I get up. It kind of annoys me. I have like this little routine. I like to exercise and stuff first. So just curiously, I explored the question and it turned out that at that moment for me, eating 300 grams of chocolate every night was good for me, okay? So as I experimented over time with no judgment, by eating more food throughout the day without the goal of eating less chocolate in the evening, that's important, but instead to ensure that I was getting enough nourishment, uh, carbs, fats, proteins, fiber throughout the day, naturally I just ate less chocolate in the evenings without even thinking about it. Now, to this day, some evenings I eat a lot of chocolate. I don't know three, 400 grams of chocolate, I don't weigh it or anything. Some some nights I do that. And you know, some nights I hardly have any chocolate. My body knows what it's doing. And so I just allow my instincts to run the show. And it's interesting, like when I've eaten more throughout the day or been fuller throughout the day, I naturally want to eat less chocolate in the evening, but I'm not really thinking about it. I'm just reflecting back now as, I, as I'm recording this to help you. So ask yourself, what evidence do I have that eating X amount of X is not serving me? And let's say you do have evidence that what you're doing is not serving you. For example, maybe you can't sleep at night because of the sugar rush. Then you can approach this from a foundation of weight neutrality and health at every size. And that I can go and talk about that for another 20 minutes, but I'm not going to because I want to really come to the to the root of what I wanted to share today, which is the inspiration I got from my dog walk this morning to answer the question of the title, why am I still quote binging when I'm not mentally and physically restricting? The words habitual wiring I want to share with you. And so if you're on, if you're watching the video, video you'll notice that I'm fidgety and scratchy and that's because I don't even know I don't even know there's any flies in here but it's hot and it's sticky and I'm itchy and I've been bitten and stung and all sorts and so I'm just itchy okay so apologies if you can hear anything or if you can see me and it's annoying you I'm sorry but I'm also not sorry because I need to do what I need to do so in my opinion and my personal experience there is an element as to why you may still be, quote, binging when you are definitely not restricting in any way, even though there's nothing wrong with binging. Here is my analogy. OK, are you ready for this? You need to bear with me as I talk about this epic story I conjured up in my head today as a reason for to answer the question. I want you to imagine a male dog who hasn't been castrated. When a female dog is in heat, the male's dog behavior around the female is driven by his biological drive to reproduce. Take my dog, Hero. If, if you are a dog person, go to my social media. He's definitely not plastered on there, but there's some photos and he's just so adorable. Bias, I know. But take my dog, Hero, right? He's a three-year-old male and he hasn't been castrated. He walks nicely on his lead. 
However, this morning he started pulling so desperately to get to this other dog that was in front of us to the point where he was like choking on his collar, bless him, to get to this dog. Turns out this dog, I kind of knew already because I know my own dog and I'm quite, I know animals as well. This dog was a female dog in heat. So he dragged me to this dog who I must say was very pleased to meet Hero as well. And Hero automatically began to sniff and lick in places that us humans would deem inappropriate, at least until we've been taken on a couple of dates and been brought dinner and stuff, you know? And then he attempted to try to mount the female dog. Good for her. She thought she would make him work for it a little bit more and started like flirting with him and spinning in circles and like doing this yelpy, yappy dog thing, which was quite cute and funny. Either way, I let the female dog and her owner go on their way in front of us and I made Hero wait. Now, when I asked Hero to wait, I tried to give him some dog biscuits that I have in my pocket that he absolutely loves. He wouldn't even eat the dog biscuit, right? He was solely focused on the female dog. His behavior was driven purely by his natural biological instinct and drive to reproduce, right? Now, let's imagine that we had Hero castrated. Don't worry, Hero. I'm telling Hero, we're not going to get you castrated. Don't worry. Let's imagine that we did, right? And after a few days when he's recovered or a few weeks, maybe even, we came into contact with another female dog or the same female, female dog who was on heat. How do you think he would behave? He would have zero biological urge to drive his behavior, yet he might act in a similar way as before because his brain is habitually wired to do so. However, over time, when he stops feeling that natural biological urge that is driven by his biology, his behavior will be more like a male dog who was castrated at an early age and therefore he won't act in the same desperate, stressy way to get to a female dog in heat. Now, did you like my cool story? How does this fit into the context of binging, again, binging in quotes, when you're not restricting anymore? In regards to you still binging, even though you're not restricting, this can be due to your biological habitual wiring. Think about it. You've attempted to restrict or diet for however many years, fill in the blank for yourself, right? And so therefore your brain is wired to binge, in quotes, due to your biological response to restriction. When we restrict, our brain increases our hunger hormones, reduces our satiety hormones, which is the hormone that helps us feel satisfied when we've eaten. And therefore it drives us to eat high fat, high sugar foods, and to eat past fullness because of the famine it thinks we're in. I'm going to say something and I want you to listen very carefully, okay? Anytime you don't eat the amount of food you truly desire to eat, aka anytime you hold yourself back from eating what you'd really like to eat, if you weren't scared of weight gain or health implications, your brain inter interpretates that as there is not enough food in our environment, therefore we must eat all that we can now and we must hoard and hide anything else that we can. So to put that into even quicker, simple context terms, anytime you don't allow yourself to fully eat the amount you truly desire, regardless of whether you're thinking about health or weight or whatever it is, even if you're thinking of someone else not having one and there's only one left and you're wondering if like you can have the last one and you don't ask that other person, you just hold yourself back and you really want it, especially if you're a chronic dieter or have been in the past, your brain will automatically, for safety and security reasons to keep you alive, will be like, oh my gosh, she's not eating everything she wants to eat from a place of fear because there's a difference not food freedom isn't eating everything all the time just because it's there 
I've said this many times before, dieting is not an action, it's a state of mind. But if you're holding yourself back through fear of any of any kind, your your brain sends signals to your body and be like, right, there must be a famine. So therefore eat everything you can, eat past fullness to get the fat stores ready and filled up and hoard and hide any food that you can. And so over time, just think again, how many years have you been dieting, right? I started when I was nine, I'm 35 now. Over time, this becomes habitual. It isn't until your body feels truly safe and like there is enough food and there is going to be no impending upcoming future restriction that you can then start to fully relax and knowing there is always going to be enough food. There's always going to be enough chocolate. There's an abundant amount. You can have it whenever you want. It's safe to relax. It's safe to eat X amount compared to X amount. It's it's the state, it's the drive. It's not even a drive. Instead of being driven by like fear and anxiety and not enoughness, whether that's consciously or unconsciously through a past trauma response, over time, you will start to relax and know that there is enough. And relaxation is the gateway into pleasure. If you think about you being intimate with a partner and having sex, you cannot have an orgasm if you're not relaxed because you cannot experience pleasure unless you're relaxed. So relaxation is the gateway to pleasure. So in order to fully relax, you can even get more pleasure out of food. So from the place of safety and relaxation and pleasure, you can then start to ask yourself, do I actually want to eat this? Not from a place of like, oh, really, I maybe I shouldn't. So therefore I'm going to check in with myself to see if I want it or not. It's literally from a curious place of, do I want to eat this? Or is it just a habitual response due to my past restriction and therefore then binging? Knowing that you can literally eat whatever the fuck it is, whenever you want, in any amount you want. You can then experiment if it feels safe to you and not restrictive in any way. You can start to experiment with serving sizes, putting chocolate into a bowl, which is what I do now. I have my favorite little bowl that I put my different chocolates into and take it to the sofa. And if I want more, I will get off off the sofa and go and get more. But you can practice with that when you feel safe to do so. Instead of eating it out of the wrapper, you can then experiment with buying small bars of chocolate instead of the family size bars of chocolate. Or you can simply also ask yourself the magic question, what evidence do I have that eating this amount is actually not okay for me? When it most likely is. And again, if it isn't okay, you can go back to the weight neutral health at every size foundational and approach it that way. So you're not causing yourself to go back to the diet binge cycle. Either way, allowance creates space for choice. And if you're still, quote, binging and not restricting, give your body and yourself enough time to really trust Actions speak louder than words. Speaking to yourself from a place of calm and reassurance is very necessary, but actions speak louder than words, even for yourself. So if you're telling yourself, it's okay, sweetheart, there's enough chocolate, there's loads in the kitchen, you can go and get more in the shop if you need it, just eat to whatever amount feels good for you. Over time, your body needs you and your body, like you, you're kind of one. I don't like to separate it, but sometimes it makes sense to use them as separate identities. Your body needs to trust your words. Actions speak louder than words. So every time you allow, 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 without yo-yoing back and forth, you'll be like, oh, no, 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 wait, this isn't okay. This is why support is so important in this process, because if you do it alone, it's so easy to go back even for a minute or a day or a second. And then therefore you've got like one foot out the door, one foot in the door. And then you're kind of thinking, well, this food freedom stuff doesn't work because of X, Y, and Z. Support is so important, but allowance creates space for choice. And if you're still binging, but you're not restricting, give your body and give yourself time to trust that the food is abundant. It will not be taken away from you again. And there's always enough should you want it. And the last thing I wanted to touch on before I end this is emotional eating. So 
emotional eating is different to binge eating, yet they can be both intertwined and often are. And I've done podcasts about this before, so I'm only going to say a few a few things about this. When we eat emotionally, it's to change our emotional state. So whether that's due to boredom, simply seeking pleasure and the taste of something delicious, numbing sadness or anxiety or to use food to comfort ourselves, which by the way is 100% okay the second we make it not okay, it turns into restriction and then you know what happens when we restrict, it kind of goes into a big spiral. So ultimately, excuse me, if you can learn through the practice and through the body image work I teach as well, because body image work is so key to this work around food, If you can practice to relax into whatever the fuck your food choices look like, that will bring you the most peace. Then food just becomes food. It will lose the power it has over you. You will have zero biological urges to drive you to eat and it won't be driving you to, quote, feel out of control anymore because you won't be restricting. So therefore you won't have that drive. It's similar to Hero, if he was castrated, he wouldn't have the biological drive and the urge to then act that way around female dogs that are in heat. You won't have that out of control feeling or urge around food because you will no longer be restricting if you practice relaxing into whatever your food looks like, right? And then food will just simply end up being what it truly is a pleasurable part of life that holds no morality to it. And so if you would like to be coached personally through this process from from dieting, restricting, looking in the mirror, hating what you see, speaking to yourself like you would speak to your worst enemy, some of you might not even notice the way you speak to yourself. If you would like help to live in food freedom and body love, you can explore the different ways that you can work with me. I in a nutshell, in a chocolate nutshell, because everything's better with chocolate, right? I have the Body Love Buffet, which is like a group coaching container. Um, That's a lower investment option. And I have then two other different ways that you can work with me one-to-one, depending on what investment that you're able to make for yourself. And I can't wait to hear from you if it feels right for you, or you can just continue listening to these podcasts, showing up in my free Facebook group where I I give a lot of support through videos and things in there as well. And if you have any questions off the back of this, or you just want to reach out and say hi, ensure that you're following me on, on Facebook and Instagram and just reach out to me and I'm here for you. And if you have any podcast requests that you'd like me to talk about, whether I turn your question into an episode and and talk in depth to your question or to your concern, and I won't have to say your name if you don't want me to, then again, just reach out to me and we can have a little chat. All right, my beautiful beings, well, not my, because you're not mine, right? But all right, beautiful beings, I wish you the most wonderful day, morning, evening, whenever you are listening to this, and I will see you next week. Mwah.